Reasons why Americans don't get paid enough American employees made an average of $27.45 per hour in June 2022. The same employees made an hourly average of $3.88 in 1972. This means that the wage growth in America has advanced significantly. However, when accounting for inflation, salaries have stayed essentially constant over the past 50 years, with employees receiving just $0.12 more than they did in 1972. We should all be concerned when an ordinary American does not experience an advance in living standards across several decades. The pain of weak wage growth is being felt by Americans as inflation reaches its highest level since 1981. According to two-thirds of American workers, income increases over the past year have been exceeded by inflation. However, some economists claim that the idea is really a hoax that politicians employ to advance their political careers. Politicians gain votes by promising to address perceived problems in voters' lives. Therefore, we can say that the discussion of wage stagnation and the promises to address the alleged issue are tinged with a little political cynicism and calculation. Hello there! This is the Financial Fortune Channel and in this video, we are going to answer what does wage stagnation imply for American workers today and how real is it in America? Before we begin, please do not forget to leave a like, click subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the notification bell to be notified whenever we release new videos. Let's get started. Since the early 1970s, American wages have stayed the same. But it wasn't until 1979 that the difference between worker productivity and pay really started to widen. Workers' earnings increased by 17.5% between 1979 and 2020, but productivity increased by 61.8% more than three times as quickly. The claim that wages haven't increased at all isn't true. While they have, their growth hasn't been as rapid as in the past. The economy has seen considerable transformation during the 1980s. Really, we have transitioned from an industrial to a technological period. Even if the benefits of these significant economic changes are not always felt equal, everyone's lifestyle and pay are affected. For those lower and middle income earners, wage stagnation is harsher. Between 1979 and 2020, the annual wages of the bottom 90% of American employees climbed by 28.2%, while salaries for the richest 1% increased by 179.3%. The richest 0.1%, however, experienced a startling rise of 389.1%. Since the late 1970s, real wages, earnings after inflation have been taken into account, have not been a significant factor. On the other hand, we are aware that inequality did increase for the majority of this time. People lost some of their jobs as has happened in my experience and we now fight to find new work, side jobs, or second part-time jobs just to cover our monthly living expenses. It's incredibly difficult. Although the COVID pandemic severely disrupted the U.S. labor market, it also produced unexpected salary increases in a variety of industries. In fact, COVID has observed a notable increase in pay growth, especially for low-income employees. This reveals a really serious stiffness in the labor market brought on by excessive U.S. demand. Whether it be from the Federal Reserve or through payments made as a part of the fiscal stimulus, but also by restrictions in the labor supply, immigration restrictions, early retirements, and of course, illness or death. The result has been significant salary growth. How can you tell if it is a new reality? Therefore, it is advised to exercise caution because of this. Did it alter our lives forever, perhaps improving them in terms of earnings and the work market? We must wait and observe. One reason for the stagnation of wages in America is automation. By 2030, according to McKinsey Global Institute, 45.3 million employments would be lost to technological developments. Up until now, automation has played a significant role, particularly in manufacturing jobs. So, in the past, building a car required using machinery, but there was also a lot of sort of manual labor involved. Now, since much more of that is carried out by machines and using those machines requires a higher level of skill, many of the regular jobs have either been eliminated or paid quite a little. Many economists predict that increased automation will generate significant disruptions in the labor market during the next two to three decades. Even workers with college degrees will face competition from these machines since they will provide financial aid, accounting, 
and even some aspects of medical diagnosis. This means that a lot more of us will be affected by this competition. Another factor in wage stagnation is globalization, which forces domestic workers to compete unfairly. Additionally, workers are paid far less in many nations. Now that you're competing in that market, especially if you don't have many highly specialized abilities, a lot of basic office work and manufacturing labor will be outsourced. However, not all of that is terrible news for Americans. It's vital to keep in mind that this resulted in much cheaper goods. It's one of the reasons why inflation has been so low since the 1980s. And many small businesses use the shortage of competition to keep their employees' wages low. If you have a local labor market, you have monopsony power. Over the years, when COVID wasn't yet around, asking a few families for a $10 rice can still make them politely decline. They claim to have found someone less expensive. You can see that government regulations were put in place repeatedly to limit labor mobility and to prevent employees from moving for a better job or to a better town or city in order to increase their job prospects. And over time, this will unavoidably have an impact on wage growth. Through strategies like non-compete agreements, businesses can also actively contribute to the stifling of competition. There are between 36 and 60 million private sector employees in the United States who are bound by non-compete agreements, according to the EPI survey responses from about half of U.S. private sector companies. Because it would be more difficult for you to obtain work if you left your current job, the non-compete provision would encourage you to stay put. Additionally, if you are less inclined to quit your job, you will be locked or connected to your current company, increasing the likelihood that you will continue to get your lesser pay. It makes sense at the very high end of the skill set's wage distribution, but it seems that there are more many benefits for lower-level personnel. In the meantime, unions that initially advocated for increased pay have significantly lost their power over time. 20% of American workers were union members in 1983, while barely 10.3% were in 2021. Due to strategies like collective bargaining, employees in unions often make more money, about 10.2% more compared to similarly situated non-union employees. Market power or employer monopsony had less of an impact on wages in those industries where unionization remained a bit high. Therefore, even when dealing with big employers, the unions were able to negotiate on behalf of the workers. Therefore, there was less wage stagnation or loss. Over the past several decades, the PCE indicates significantly more moderate inflation. When PCE is applied to nominal wage increases, middle-class workers experience considerably higher wage growth. So there is absolutely no wage stagnation. In reality, there has been a considerable gain during the past 30 years. Another problem may arise if general national data are prioritized above specific personal experiences. They note an increase in the proportion of low-paying jobs. As a result, there is stagnation or fall in wages. What they fail to do is to take a closer look at persons who work in such fields and how their pay has changed over time. Some of the most significant problems underlying wage stagnation in America may be resolved through legislation. When there are significant advances in technology, globalization, and other forces, there is a limit to how much we can do through legislation, but a lot can depend on the policy. For instance, I believe that non-compete clauses contribute to wage stagnation and they shouldn't be used, especially for low-skilled employment. We could enact laws to make it simpler for employees to form unions. Protect Our Right to Organize Act or PRO Act, a bill, has already been approved by the House of Representatives. In the Senate, it is no chance of passing. We also need to embrace the gig economy more, which I feel like we've been doing so far by pretending it doesn't exist and treating it like a low-tier segment of the labor market. But if we let those platforms offer health insurance, I think it may lead to better quality occupations that are more dynamic and give people a greater opportunity to take on upside risk as well as downside risk. The expansion of remote work could also help local labor markets increase wages. Some employers are pleased when their staff members work remotely. In a way, if you have the ability to work remotely, at least you are aware that you are lessening the monopsony power of an employer because if you are a smart person, even if you live in a small town with only one or two major employers, you can work for a multinational company that can be based anywhere in the world or the United States and work remotely while earning a higher salary.
The success of the American economy depends on achieving fair pay for all citizens. Not only there is a fundamental sense of justice, but there is also what has historically been referred to as the American dream. It draws immigrants to our country's borders. It inspires all types of people to innovate and stimulate the economy. And in certain ways, the productivity and skills of American employees are reflected in salaries. Therefore, if wages are stagnating for a large number of individuals, it indicates that our nation is not becoming as productive as it could be. That implies that the entire economy is not operating as the best it can be. That's all for today, folks. I hope you learned a lot from this video on the reasons why Americans don't get paid enough. What do you think? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. This is Financial Fortune and thank you for watching.